Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Derval. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Adult Learner online discussion. This journal critically reflects the practices of teaching and learning and shares knowledge that informs our understanding within the sector. You can find the 2023 edition on our website. It's a peer reviewed open access journal. I'd like to congratulate all of the writers for having their contributions published. It's a huge success and say a massive thank you to all of our editorial board and our editor, Dr. Rosemary Moreland and our team in-house, especially Juliana, who has once again made sure that everything has gotten across the line and it is no easy feat, especially for a publication like this. So we're delighted to be joined today by our editor, Rosemary, and our members of the editorial board, our speakers, Jason Harris and Professor Leo Casey, and many of the contributors who have had their success in getting published in the journal this year. After we hear from Jason and Leo, each contributor in turn will give a brief overview of their article in the journal. We'll then break into discussion groups where you can actually speak to the contributors directly and also talk to each other. This will be a really nice part of the session and we'll focus on the topics of creating learner-centered education, learning development and holistic thinking, equal access and policy and practice. So thank you again for joining us. And I'm now going to hand you over to Rosemary who will give us an overview of the contributions. myself. Um, can everybody hear me okay? So good morning everyone um, and thank you very much for joining us here this morning um, and I want to just give you a brief sort of overview. I'm not going to go into the specific articles because we are going to do that obviously this morning and you'll have lots of opportunities to um, hear from the authors themselves but I suppose what I want to just kind of take you through really is um, the overview in terms of you know the, this year's edition of the of the art of the journal sorry. Um, and, you know, in the previous years, we had um, themed calls for our um, editions of the journal. But last year, we all kind of decided uh, that actually we would like to just, you know, give out an open call um, and see what comes in, you know, because adult learning, adult education is such a, a wide and eclectic um, range of practices that we thought it would be really interesting to just have an open call um, and allow people then to kind of place themselves within um, you know, what are obviously the, the overarching sort of principles and guidelines for our journal. Um, and this did indeed result in a wide range of articles being submitted. Um, and then following our very thorough peer review process, we then accepted um, seven articles, um, which are what are now published in the, the journal, which is available online and, um, and some hard copies as well. And in addition to that, we always like to have some um, book and policy reviews as well. And I think that's really important for readers as well to get that kind of maybe brief synopsis and also kind of critique um, of, you know, forthcoming or recently published books and also, you know, re relevant sort of recent policy. So um, in the journal, you'll also find after you read through all the lovely articles, um, when you get to the next section, then there are three book reviews and one policy review and they're quite short and brief so I would encourage you you know also to have a, a quick look at them as well um, because they really do provide you know excellent um, food for thought for us so um, you know as of, I'm sorry just to say yes that we are actually really delighted that we have many of the authors here with us today um, you know as Juliana and, and Derville were saying so um, it is a great opportunity for us to actually hear from the authors in person and really to have an opportunity to engage in a critical discussion and debate around some of the, the key issues that their articles cover. Um, so, you know, these the articles that we have selected, um, you know, cover this very broad range of areas. And this is something I think in terms of the editorial board, you know, that we're very keen to, you know, ensure that th this journal continues really to appeal to the broad church of adult education. Um, we recognise that, you know, adult learners come in all shapes and sizes and forms. They come from such a wide variety of experiences um, that it's really important that the journal represents and gives, you know, opportunity for those voices to be heard. So we recognise, you know, the very many settings in which adult education and adult learning takes place, you know, from community-based education through to work-based and vocational settings and right through to further and, and higher education. And of course, as we all recognize, you know, adult learning can be unaccredited and, you know, has lots of benefits for people engaging in unaccredited learning 
And those you know, benefits are, as we all know, as valuable, if not maybe even more valuable um, as our you know, experiences of COVID have definitely taught us, you know, that, you know, unaccredited um, adult learning is so important for so many different factors of our lives, but right through also to accredited learning. And that can be, you know, in terms of, you know, um, English as a second language, numeracy, literacy, you know, right through to, you know, vocational qualifications and degrees and even higher degrees. Um, so it's really great to see that, you know, in the articles that we have represented in this journal that they really do cover, I suppose, the, the broad gamut of those um, different sort of perspectives. And I suppose another um, important point that we feel, you know, wants to we want to put across with the, the journal is to recognise that um, adult educators themselves come into the practice also from a very wide range of backgrounds um, and different sort of professional and even theoretical backgrounds and you know indeed you know many of these may be underpinned by competing ideologies and values and beliefs and we believe that um, it is really important that the journal can reflect this you know widespread range of sort of philosophical and, and ideological beliefs that there is no kind of like one right way to do adult education or for people to engage in adult learning but rather you know the journal really provides that um, space for critical inquiry and discussion which we believe then also leads to transformational learning for all of us so you know again encouraging you just to you know go in and dip into the journal and, and read up on some of the articles and hopefully you're experience of engaging in this discussion today you know might also provide you you know with you know learning you know for yourself and I certainly when I'm reading the articles I learn so much from um reading the, these articles uh you know and it, it piques all kinds of interests for me to go off in different directions of, of adult learning and adult education that I haven't engaged in before so you know it, it's really exciting and um, as I say it's, it's great that we have so many of the authors here with us today that we can you know um, learn from them because they all have you know um, expertise in so many different areas of adult learning and education that you know I so know personally you know I might have very little in, in some of these areas so it's just a fantastic opportunity that you know to be able to engage and and also, as I say, critique and challenge um, and have those open, honest and professional conversations, which can you know, help to transform ourselves as well as, as others. Um, and indeed, you know, um, as, as we said, in terms of having you know, policy and book reviews, you know, again, it's I guess it's important to recognize that, you know, adult education kind of doesn't just take place in a vacuum. You know, we can't when we walk inside that classroom or community centre or whatever, you know, that we close the door and forget about what's going on outside. And, you know, policy, as we know, social policy, you know, has a huge impact, um, not just, I suppose, on the actual practice um, of adult education, but actually on the lives of the adult learners that come through our doors, you know. So having a, a good understanding of current policies and the impact that they may have, you know, both on ourselves as practitioners, but also then on the adult learners, you know, we also feel it is really important um, to get that broader understanding. So again, you know, having those discussions, you know, can help us and, and push our boundaries as well, which I think is always a, a really good thing. Um, so, and sometimes, you know, it's actually difficult for us to recognize the commonalities that we do have. Um, you know, when we think of different kind of professions, doctors and lawyers and, you know, whatever else, you know, and so many, different areas of, of you know uh, occupations you know have unions they have um, you know bodies that kind of represent them um, and you know quite often I think adult educators can feel quite isolated and marginalized you know within their own practice and that's why it's so important that you know the work that Intus does and um, to create that opportunity and that space for adult educators um, of all varieties and all different backgrounds or whatever to be able to, to come together and feel that they have a, a shared voice and a, a collective voice. And again, um, what Intus is so good at, I think, is in terms of providing that space for the adult learners and for their voice, you know, because we know that, that is so um, critical and, and underpins really, you know, everything that we do 
um, in terms of, of adult education that we, you know, if it is about empowering and enabling, enabling people, you know, to be, you know, the best that they can be to transform their lives, then, you know, we want to ensure that actually they have the opportunity to speak for themselves, of, you know, that they don't need to have other people speaking on behalf of them. Um, and I guess that's one of our kind of um, signals in a sense, you know, that we're doing a good job, you know, if we actually, you know, um, have found that, you know, adult learners are wanting then to, to speak for themselves and on behalf of maybe some of their other learning cohorts. So it is great that we um, have one of our adult learners here with us today to tell us his own story in his own words, you know, and, um, you know, for myself, definitely, you know, the whole Frey area and principle of, you know, adult educators and learners are on a journey together. You know, that's something that I hold very dear to myself. Um, hopefully you all do too. It's something certainly that, you know, I've experienced throughout my 30 years of um, teaching in the adult education sector that, um, you know, I have always learned far more from my students than what they have learned from me. Um, and I, you know, so that, that's the, for me, the joy, you know, of, of adult education is that we're on that journey together and we learn so much from each other. So having our, our adult learners be able to articulate their voice and their experience is so important. And as I say, we're really glad that um, they're here with us today. And I suppose just finally, um, I want to give a little nod to the north of Ireland. I should probably hear from my accent. So, um, and that I am involved with the Forum for Adult Learning in Northern Ireland, um, who are building those relationships with um, ANTUS, uh, as well as you know having relationships across the UK. And I think in terms of you know having that collective voice, you know it is so important because. In the north, we're quite small, and you know, and certainly adult education is very disjointed, and there isn't really that one collective voice. So we really appreciate and are so um, delighted, I suppose, to have that you know ongoing relationship with Intus, which hopefully will continue and help to further strengthen us, you know, so that um, the Forum for Adult Learning in Northern Ireland can then become a voice for adult educators and adult learners in the north of Ireland, and that going forward. You know, collectively, we know um, our voices are much stronger when we work together. Um, and so we were delighted with the, the piece of work that Antis carried out earlier um, in the last few years there um, on, on, um, with Falney then to produce the Northern Ireland Community Education Census, which was launched then in September 2023. Um, and if anyone wants to have a look at that, that is on the ANTIS website. So um, again, you know, if you're wanting to get some information on, you know, where community education is in, in terms of Northern Ireland, um, this is the first ever uh, community education census that has been taken in Northern Ireland. So um, as I say, we are absolutely delighted that ANTIS was able to support that work um, taking place. And as I say, hopefully that, um, you know, collaboration will, will continue to bear fruit. Um, you know, we believe that um, ANTIS has, you know, long been renowned as that space for critical debate um, and challenge. Uh, and that is something that, as I say, the, the editorial board for the Adult Learning Journal are, all, you know, also hold very close to us. And that's why obviously we're very grateful for, you know, the, the sponsorship and the support that ANTIS provides for the Adult Learner Journal, which, you know, otherwise just would not make um, the, the publication of this journal at all possible. So I would like to thank the whole ANTIS team for the excellent hard work that they do behind the scenes and, and pulling all of this together, you know. Has You're very kind. Topic. Thank you so much, Robin. <laughs> not, <laughs> not at all. Too many not, nice things there. <laughs> not at all. But, Brilliant. Yeah. OK, so yes, so just to say, yes, that we hope that everyone really enjoys their day today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosemary. And um, you're very good. Our next speaker is Jason Harris. Jason is an apprentice arborist. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, he's involved in the study, cultivation and management of trees. And even this morning, while we were preparing for the session, all of the team and all the contributors were asking him questions about trees. <laughs> Poor man's already been leaned on for his expertise. He's undertaken this apprenticeship in Galway and Roscommon ETB, and he's also a participant in our current Learners as Leaders programme, which focuses on learners who want to become advocates for themselves and others. 
That's exactly what he's here to do today. And he's going to tell us about the challenges that he and other apprenticeships have experienced and what can be done to make things better. So thank you so much, Jason. I'll hand it over to you now. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I said, I was currently taking part in the Level 6 Apprenticeship in Arbor Culture in Petersburg, Outdoor Education Centre in Clumber. Um, I first heard about the course when I was working in the arboricultural and tree surgery industry abroad in Norway, uh, where I lived for five years, and uh, decided to leave the life I created for myself and return home to upskill and further my education. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with what we do, the majority of us work in the trees, climbing ropes with chainsaws, uh, sometimes next to the ESB high voltage power lines where one mistake can be your last. Uh, we recognise as an essential service in maintaining the national power grid throughout the country. Um, so the main issues myself and my fellow students had to face last year was trying to pay the accommodation fees and also the fuel costs travelling to and from the training centre to our homes, uh, which in some cases is a three and a half hour drive. As apprentices, we get paid very little as it is many of us struggle to pay our fees and travel expenses along with paying our own personal expenses at home, such as uh, renting a house or maintaining a family. Uh, in some cases, we had learners resorting to sleeping in their cars as they could not afford to stay in accommodation, uh, which I think is appalling in this day and age. Um, in May last year, I managed to deliver a report to Minister Harris personally at the department spending and planning event for 2024, but received uh, zero feedback, which is disappointing. Uh, in my opinion, a student might not be an expert in what it is they are studying, but they are an expert in the learning experience and should be listened to and engaged with properly to make the learning experience better for future students. Um, after all this uh, survey was created and presented to the learners and each of us expressed our honest opinion as to how we were being affected financially and also the impact it was having on our mental health. I'll share with you today two separate submissions by two of the apprentices. Also, please note that the names and places have been redacted to protect our identity. So apprentice four, biggest, the biggest concern is financial stress, which in turn is impacting my mental health. This in turn has a negative domino effect on my studies, my work capabilities and my personal life. I recently had to move back home as I couldn't afford to cover all of my bills and such a small weekly income. I just turned 30, so this is pretty shameful and is adding to my mental health struggles. I'm commuting to Petersburg from Redacted as the fuel costs work out slightly cheaper than the accommodation costs. I'm also bringing a packed lunch to save on money. If the accommodation and food is covered, I would definitely stay and eat in Petersburg, not to mention all the travel impacts on my ability to do assignments in the evening time. All of the travel is having an impact on the maintenance of my car. This is more weight added to the financial burden. I also feel that not being able to stay has had a social impact and that I feel I would not be able to mesh. I feel I would be able to mesh better with the group and form stronger social bonds. At the end of the day, even with sacrificing so much already, I am unsure whether I will be able to stay on the course. Grant relief is needed and needed now if the course hopes to continue. Um, and another survey from Apprentice 5. My employer has agreed to give me the money uh, he gets from the apprenticeship. This covers a portion of the rent for Petersburg, but does not cover all of it, nor does it cover fuel or the loss of wage for the two weeks period in Petersburg. These financial pressures have been having a significant impact on my mental health, including having a negative impact on my relationship with my partner due to struggling to pay the bills and not having money to do the things that a healthy couple might do, like going out or going away. All in all, I would say the biggest impact has been on my mental health and feelings of self-worth. So in total, there's been 17 surveys collected. And as you can see, there are, are some serious issues that the learners are facing at the moment. Uh, I took it upon myself to become a learner representative within GRETB after reviewing the GRETB quality assurance procedures. 
within this document it states that the learner representative is required. I was told that this has not been created yet. This leaves us as students of GRETB in a vulnerable position as we have no representative to voice our concerns and troubles to the board officially. Um, in November, I attended the adults, <coughs> the, Ad the Aintis Adult Education Summit 2023, where I was presented with an opportunity to deliver a further report to Minister Harris about the key points from the surveys and also how to lessen the financial burden on learners. Uh, what I propose is that the apprenticeship programme should be granted uh, fuel and rent allowance from the Department of Social Protection. I'm aware that if you attend a learning programme through SOLACE, you can avail of these allowances while you're on a course. Uh, personally, I think it should be the same for the apprenticeship programmes. <clears throat> this would also make these courses more attractive. Um, I'm also aware that the core inequality myself and my peers face is the craft versus new apprenticeship divide. Apprenticeships in Ireland are categorised as craft, which is uh, pre-2016, or new, which is post-2016. Take up to four years to complete, earning a level five and upwards on the national framework of qualifications. Craft apprentices receive a training allowance during off-the-job elements of their apprenticeships and typically take up to four years, funded by both the Exchequer and National Training Fund. This allowance varies with each phase and trade in line with wage, gross wage norms in the sector. Uh, new apprenticeships, which are post-2016, are minimum two years long and do not receive a training allowance from the state during their training. I recently found out there, there will be a merge between craft and new apprenticeships, but finding out a timeline on this was unsuccessful. My fear is that as more learners enter apprenticeship programs, they'll be subjected to the poverty and hardship uh, I and my fellow classmates are having to endure. Uh, something has to change to ensure current and future learners do not have to resort to sleeping in their cars to attending a training program and make something of their lives. Uh, thank you all for listening to my experience and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Jason. Like the words just ring so loudly. I think they're subjected to poverty and hardship. No person entering education should ever be further at risk of poverty. It should be something that's a positive, transformative experience that improves your conditions and your opportunities. So genuinely, it means a lot for us to hear your honest account. And I think it's a courageous thing to do. And I think as a collective here today, it's also important to acknowledge the fact that we can't always just share positive learner stories. We need to share the stories of the hardship and try to improve the circumstances for everybody involved. And fair play to you for continuing on your journey. And I'm sure all of us here today will support you in that. And I do hope that things improve. And Aintis is also going to have a campaign next year around these issues. And we're really glad that you're going to be part of that. So thanks so much, Jason. Our next speaker is Professor Leo Casey, uh, who is the Director for the Centre of Education and Lifelong Learning at the National College of Ireland. He's a committed educator and advocate for lifelong learning who believes that education is a core human value and it enables participation and gives meaning to our lives. His professional work combines education delivery with development, innovation and research. So I'll hand it over to you, Leo. Leo. Thank you. Thanks, Derbal. Um, I'm just uh, going to... Uh, share my screen for a moment and I want to just make sure we've got everything up and running. So maybe a thumbs up uh, that you can actually see this. And I'm, yeah. so I'm going to talk for the next um, 10 minutes or so on this topic. It's transformative learning for challenging times. So it's kind of a big ask. Um, and when I read the uh, issue of the journal, um, I felt that there was so much in it. There's so many different uh, contexts and activities in adult learning happening that it would be a good idea at this point in the launch to provide something like a bigger picture overview and um, without wanting to overstate it, some kind of general mission direction for adult education. So this is um, what I propose to do. And um, when we uh, think about um, learning and we often 
uh, talk about critical thinking and the development of critical awareness. And people ask me to provide some kind of academic uh, understanding or definition of that. And I always say, it's just asking a simple question that we all ask. There's no, no great wisdom in it. We ask this question, what's going on? And if you keep asking that question about a situation and don't accept the first immediate answer and you keep pressing with exactly what's going on, you'll find that it opens up wider and deeper understanding of the world. Um, what's going on at the moment, in my view, around the world is that um, we we are living in uh, challenging times. Um, and I just, uh, as by way of kind of... Uh, uh, evidence i say look look at climate change and how complex it is and how um how that presents us all with a common challenge and then in response to climate change we also have a requirement for sustainable development and to do that within a global socially just context so these are two big issues that uh, we need to face and that we maybe had in the past thought we're off in the distance but they're now really upon us and of course, you don't have to go very far in the evening watching the media to, to see war and violence uh, happening. And also there's a kind of a relatively new phenomenon now of toxic debate and false narratives. Um, and um, also I mention this uh, idea of digital world alienation. And that are people who feel that the, the world is rapidly developing without them and they feel left out. And I think as adult educators, we're all familiar with the ways in which these challenges impact on our students, ourselves, and the work that we do. So I propose that when we look at learning that we need to almost shift our focus from, because we often focus on learning in a very narrow way. We focus on learning that we're doing now rather than over our life in terms of lifelong learning. We focus on learning in our own specific context rather than appreciating that there's a global aspect to learning. And, you know, I'm blessed to be involved in a project with Cambodian education. And then so when you when you go to Cambodia and look at the way in which the world is viewed from that perspective, it gives you remarkable insights on our own perspectives here and how they compare with with other systems. And then the most important of all is the notion of learning at the level of values. So this is a deeper level than most of us emphasize. Often we emphasize skills and competence and um, uh, our, our, our uh, knowledge. But imagine that underneath all of that is a sense of value of what's important in the world and what's important for us. And this sense of value is a learned process. So what are values? Well, they're part of our identity. So we know that we, we, we often say, I, I value this. And we talk about that in terms of ourselves. They're internal motivations as distinct from, you know, we're not, we want to act in a particular way. And it's a tendency to act in certain situations. The most important part of it is that values are learned. And so we have a, a framework today of learning outcomes where we say after the, um, you know, course the students will be able to do and that's an outcome based one but what about after the course the students will tend to do that's a different thing that's at the level of value and that's a much richer form of learning um, uh, and when we look at the big challenges that I've spoke about then you actually have to address those at the level of values so here are examples of values from a project that I'm involved in, in terms of um, post-primary education and uh, young people in the Northeast inner city. We, we, we've developed a new award there and the outcomes of the award are value-based rather than just learning outcome-based. And here are the values that we work with, valuing myself, valuing others, valuing challenge and valuing our world. And we know that values are developed um, in, in youth as people become from children to adults. And then in adulthood, we have a process called transformative learning, which is really about the transformation of our values. Now we may assume when we think about, you know, where we are today, that our values are fixed and that, you know, we have the best values. And if you think back, well, think back in societal terms, you'd say there was a period of time way in the past when people thought it was great to have, you know, kind of oppressive colonization and slavery and all sorts of other 
uh, you know, aspects of the way in which the world was organized. There was a period of time in the relatively recent time. So, for example, I'd say in my lifespan, when I went to school, it was OK to hit our students like that was corporate punishment. We felt that was fine when I was young. It was acceptable to have six or seven pints and then to get into a car. It was almost a macho thing to do. All of those actions today are abhorrent. And rightly, rightly so, we see that our values as a society have shifted and moved on. And you can look at our values with respect to so many different aspects and how these values evolve. And how do societal values evolve? Simply by the collective reframing of individual values. So we, are, we our values are transforming throughout our lives. Um, and just a very useful uh, you know, way of thinking about how we reason, how we develop our values is to look at the distinction between two forms of reasoning. One is instrumental reasoning. And here's an example of it. This is the instruction from Ikea on how to build a kind of a shelf at home. You kind of got to follow that and eventually you can kind of structure something. So there's a definite outcome and we can see it. It's, it's really not uh, something that gets debated or anything like that. You follow the instructions and the, the item gets made. Whereas if we talk about communicative reasoning, that's where we work together to solve a problem. Like what is the most just way of adjusting our economies for in response to climate change? Or how do we deal with uh, new people who come to Ireland? Or so, so much of what we have to do in our world is around communicative rationality or communicative reasoning. And here's an example from um, Northern Ontario in um, uh, Canada. These were rocks uncovered in a forest and they had a lot of uh, patterns and shapes. And they were known by the local people as the rocks that teach. Um, and those people curate a center there and they talk about learning. What's wonderful is that you can almost see a kind of a separate evolution of learning institutions and lifelong learning and the values of learning uh, separate from the, the way in which we see it in terms of our own uh, development. And what they say here, I love it because they say, if the legends fall silent, who will teach our children? And look at the way in which they say our schools and universities are our elders. And they talk about the way in which knowledge is transferred through communicative reasoning, we'll say, and in their way, through the spiritual and through the storytelling. Um, so this model here is like um, uh, probably when you think about it, as we go through our lives and we experience different, I don't know, we'd say questions um, or situations that question our pre-existing values. And we say, maybe that's not the best way to think about that. And we try to change them. That's the process of transformative learning. And so our beliefs, our assumptions, which were previously unquestioned, something happens, we have to, you know, look at them again, and then we develop new meanings, new ways of thinking about the world. That's that's the process. And it's a quintessential adult learning process. And I say it's informed and energized by the school of life. And as I said, right now, our lives are being impacted by these big challenges. And so I'm informed and energized to kind of look at what is my approach in values in terms of sustainability or social justice? Because of what I'm seeing or I'm, I see something on the television about war and, and violence or I, I, I hear about like, you know, toxic debates and I respond to those through, through the reframing of some aspects of my own value system. So uh, it, our fundamental perspectives get changed in this way. And one of the things that I always argued is that for for many years, the underpinnings of adult learning has always had these qualities and characteristics. We even hear, hear about it, like, you know, where we as adult educators feel that we, we should be walking with our students, that our students' voice is very important to us, as we just witnessed in the previous speaker, that it's really important that we work together in a non, uh, you know, kind of power relationship and you know here i talk about discourse as a process of trying to build common understanding to do so discourse is not about debate it's non-adversarial and people with vested interests are you know either declare them or they shouldn't be bringing them into the room we'll say um so this process is a really important process in relation to furthering the values of our society so just a quick example here the sustainability challenge that we have. And what, what's happening is scientists are telling us all the time, you know, 
it's going to be 1.5 degrees, it's going to be 1.6 degrees if we, you know, do this in terms of carbon emissions. So that's instrumental reasoning. And you know what, like I get that and fully accept it. What we need now is lots of communicative rationality for how we do that response in a fair way. And as I say, adult and, and communicate, uh, uh, community education can provide spaces for discourse. And if, if that's happening, then people don't have to be incentivized by grants for electric cars or something like that. They're just much more inclined to have internalized the value of the and the fragility of our, um, our, our world and to take care in the decisions that they make about the future of our planet. So to summarize, changing behavior is not the same as changing values and changing values is what we should as adult educators aspire to. Ultimately, we require global transformation of values and we need to find good ways and good spaces for reasoning because when we don't do it, when we don't show our students how to reason, then you get these toxic debates in social media and you get those falsehoods and they're given life and license and we need to be able to counteract that. Uh, so transformative learning, lifelong, worldwide and values deep. That's the way in which that's the kind of big picture in which we should go. And for me, it's the most important adult education challenge. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Leo. That was brilliant. I think it's really nice to have those types of contributions on a morning like this where you just feel like your soul and your brain is nourished. <laughs> that will definitely keep us going now. Um, very insightful. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted now to pass back to Rosemary, who's going to give us an overview of our discussion groups. And then we'll go into each discussion group uh, led by Rosemary for the next section. Thanks, Rosemary. OK, thank you, Dorothea. Um, and yes, I think uh, Leo has certainly provided us lots more food for thought. So hopefully we'll carry some of those ideas forward then into our discussion groups, which will happen um, quite shortly. But um, I suppose now just to basically introduce. So as I said earlier, we do have um, a lot of our authors are here present today. Um, so uh, we have um, three different workshops. Sorry, am I right here? Four, sorry, four workshops. <laughs> Um, that we will be um, breaking into a little bit later. So the first one is on, um, sorry, uh, creating learner-centered education. Um, and so we have um, Mari Carmen Bustigo Alvarez, who will be speaking to us and just giving us a, a brief overview of um, her article on exploring and developing pedagogies for neurodiverse students in further education and training in Ireland. Thank you. Um, Marie Carmen. Hi everyone. Thank you, Leo, for that inspiring lecture. Much appreciated. So I will start with the main points and, and Talisa, we co-wrote together. So she will continue on with the recommendations if that's okay. So um, the main points of our article is um, we just really aimed to bridge the knowledge gap and explore the unique experiences of the voices of neurodiverse adult students in third education in Ireland. We concentrated in the PLC, post leave insert, and we mainly wanted to understand the constraints that really affect the quality of learning in the FET sector, honoring the authentic voices of neurodiverse students and on their holistic experiences. So the findings um, suggest that there is a lack of support in FET towards neurodiverse students, and these put them at risk and it can really lead to negative outcomes. The literature indicates that there are challenges that diminish inclusive practices in FET, such as pressurizing working environments for teachers and inconsistent support. Also the focus on coping and complying with performative and performance demands rather than developing ways of enhancing teaching and learning and values. And um, also the literature suggests that the gap and this is one of the key things really, that inclusive pedagogy in theory and the implementation in practice, there is a huge gap there. 
Also, um, our recommendations create a much more equitable learning environment for neurodiversity and potentially for every student. And the research really intends to introduce an inclusive and equitable framework for teacher training and bridge that gap by listening to the unique voices of neurodiverse students. And I'll pass that on to Talisa now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Thank you for the thumbs up. So again, as Mari Carmen said, the study suggests that we we need, uh, and I say we because I'm here in the U.S. and you all are mainly in Ireland. I heard some North Irelands in there as well. And we, we need a more equitable framework. And so where, where we come in here is the Quantum 10, which the Q10, which is a brief, it's kind of a short uh, name for the Quantum 10, the Elements as Evidence-Based Framework. Um, it comes in to contribute to the betterment of the F of the um, further education program. And so it's an effectiveness, um, a, a, a framework that will be effective for all students, but we're specifically thinking about neurodiverse students because a lot of times we forget that particular audience, right? And it's like, whether they're adult learners or, or young younger adult learners, we forget that we really absolutely need to have something that's going to really capture their learning abilities, their learning styles. And so the framework does just that. So um, educators, they need tools um, to serve their students with high quality um, research-based and evidence-based um, tools. And so the Quantum 10 is the, the framework that actually takes care of that. And um, the research also suggests that the Quantum 10 framework um, is an opportunity and when I say the quantum 10 framework, the elements involved mainly in the quantum 10 framework um, address the inequities that really happen in further education programs and, and, and definitely programs in general, schools and um, any type of learning environment as well. And so um, with that, the gaps can surely close slowly, but surely close. Um, the findings also support um, that the, the diversity and the characteristic of human ex, um, existence and that we can't um, segregate students. We need to make sure that all of our students, all of our learners, I'll say, um, have the opportunity to thrive. And if we would love for our students to thrive, our learners to thrive, then we need to ensure that we have something that's going to uh, close, uh, I'll call it chasms because gaps are small, but chasms are large. Um, and then an adult-centered approach, a student-centered approach, a learner-centered approach um, is a part of a paradigm shift. And that's something that we're all shifting to, the United States, Ireland, across the world. A lot of times we stand up as um, uh, as instructors and we forget that our clients are students. And so it, we, we really are looking at that learner-centered approach. Um, also, it's recommended that the Quantum 10, the Q10 framework is applied in every teacher training program. It has the potential to provide a valuable tool for leadership um, to create an environment that could be conducive for individuals um, to flourish in their daily life. So thank you. And I will pass it back to, I'm not sure who I'm passing it back to, but I'm passing it back. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, um, Talisa and Mary Carmen. Um, pass the baton on, <laughs> it feels like. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Karis Hughes from Aintus, who um, provided a book review for the, the journal um, um, that was Making Inclusive Higher Education a Reality, Creating a University for All. Thank you, Karis. Thanks so much, Rosemary. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so I reviewed uh, a book for the journal. I'm just going to put in a link to it here uh, so that you can see it. So as Rosemary says, it was making inclusive higher education a reality, creating a university for all. I began the book review by talking about the cover of the book, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen and show you why that was, because I think it's a case of uh, a, a cover really showing you what the book is about. Um, so little plug there for the book as well as on sale at the moment. So if you're interested in getting a copy, it's a good time to do so. 
Um, but you can see that the cover of the book is an apple with a bite taken out of it. And I felt that that was a cover that really exemplified what the book was about, because it is about the fact that making universities or making anywhere inclusive and accessible is an incremental process. It takes time and it has to be started one bite at a time, as the authors uh, put it themselves. They have a, a motto in the book, which is about expecting imperfection. So it's really a very practical guide um, about this process. It's not making the argument, which I hope has already been accepted, that uh, making education inclusive and accessible is an important thing to do. It really moves on to how that can be done. Um, and I think it does so very powerfully for a couple of reasons. Um, the first being that it has a very wide range of contributors, both Irish and international, but it also has a very wide perspective. So not everyone who's writing in this book is um, a working academic. So there are pieces by, uh, for example, the estate management services um, in UCD. It focuses a lot, as I said, on the University for All initiative. Um, so there, there are a lot of chapters that are very uh, go into a lot of detail really about how that initiative came about and how it's been implemented um, and that makes it a very useful sort of how-to guide for anyone um, it's really very useful beyond the higher education sector so if it is uh, something that someone would like to you know see how they would actually implement I think it's a really really useful um, and approachable place to start and as I say I think the the multiplicity of viewpoints those different authors those different aspects of the process really make it um, a very, very interesting read. So what that means is, uh, for example, that it moves beyond um, the education remit to things like, you know, um, making sure that a campus has electronic doors rather than push doors, making sure that there are ramps, making sure there's quiet spaces um, for uh, people who need them, people who, who may have neurodiversity or uh, different ways of learning and so on. So I think that that moves it into quite a practical area, which I think is really, uh, really important. Um, it also includes a lot of toolkits and documents, which I think is a very generous act actually to, to share all of those. And they've been useful even to our own work in AINTA. So I really do, do uh, recommend it for, for that reason. Um, the other thing, as I said, that makes the book really valuable is that core tenant of expecting imperfection. It's very honest about where things have not gone as they uh, were intended to. So there's an example in the book, for example, of um, organizing a welcome event for students, new students into the university and, and uh, trying to, to make them really welcome and giving them a lot of information about the campus, uh, telling them what to expect about the, the year ahead and so on. And really they discovered that that wasn't what students wanted at that point. It wasn't what they were ready for. What they wanted was an opportunity to meet others and to socialize. And so they changed that the following year. They made their welcome event much more about getting to know each other and then used a student network to give the same information about orientation, so on a little bit later when they were more ready to receive it. So again, I think it's, it's that very practical focus um, that I think is, is really, really helpful. Um, I did just want to highlight a couple of chapters that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, there is one by an early career academic named Mary Farrelly, who's talking about the importance of the toolkit for inclusive higher education in her own work. So having worked in, in universities for a little while, her prior experience, I think, was that things like inclusion and accessibility were part of what she called a minority tax. So if you were from a community that was traditionally underrepresented in universities, it became your business um, to try and teach about inclusion and accessibility and to put those practices in place. And she says from her experience that having this toolkit in place actually made it everybody's business and that that relieved some of the burden on her and on other people from under underrepresented backgrounds to really make it a very embedded process across the university. The only, I suppose, critique I have of the book is that it would have been really valuable to have an equivalent piece by an early stage student because it is so much about um, the student body and, uh, and making learners comfortable and, you know, feeling that they're really included in their university. Um, but that's a, a very minor point about it. Overall, I feel it's a remarkable achievement and it has relevance beyond, far beyond the higher education sector. And uh, I think, as I said at the end of the review, that Apple is one we should all be taking a bite out of. And it's a really good guide to doing that. 
Okay, thank you very much for that, Karis. That sounds really um, interesting. We'll all be rushing off to Amazon now to, to get our copy of the book. Um, so moving on then to our next um, breakout room, then we'll be looking at learning development on holistic thinking. And we have three of our authors present here today who will be participating in that workshop. So our first author then is Gary Nicholson. Um, whose article was the Thinking Folk Project. That's a short title. I leave Gary to give us the full title. Thank you, Garrett. Hello. Um, I, if I give you a, hello, everybody. If I give you a little bit of context, um, so in the UK, um, most local authorities get given money for community learning, but very little of it um, actually ever gets spent in the community. Because um, the, there's a line in um, um, George Orwell's 1984, which is about, um, the lie becomes the truth. Um, and the lie that most people go with is that all adult education should lead to a job or a job outcome, um, and it doesn't. So quite often this money doesn't get spent for the multiple other reasons that it can do. Um, so the Thinking Folk Project was about spending the money, um, not for that reason. Um, and Leo made a line, which I'm going to use, um, earlier, which was about discourse that's not about debate, which is which is what the Thinking Folk Project actually was, and it was inspired by um, my PhD research because I I spoke to educators working in folk schools around the world, and for most of them, there's I mean, there's lots of things distinctive about that education that educational philosophy, for want of a better word. Um, one is that. Um, integral to what they do is talking about life's big questions um, to enable you to understand yourself better, your relationship with other people and your place in the world. Um, and the other thing that they don't do is qualifications, mostly. Um, cer certainly none of the ones in Europe um, do qualifications. Uh, so I was really attracted to this um, form of what I would say was transformative adult learning. So um, I was in conversation with um, somebody in Denmark and doing my literature review and um, Socratic dialogues came up a lot. They referenced educators more than 100 years ago sitting like Socrates in their lessons. So uh, I ended up reading a book because I'd never done a Socratic dialogue before. Thought I like this. Um, a Socratic dialogue is when you take a value or an idea and you define it. So you don't debate it, you define it to get that like common understanding. So it, it, depending on what topic you want to choose, it could be you know, you know, what actually does it mean to feel safe? Um, so I tried it out. Well, I persuaded a, an ESOL tutor to gather some learners together and try it out for the first time. Um, half of them didn't turn up, so we ended up on the phone ringing them up. They came in. And they loved it. They loved it because it got them to use their English differently. They loved hearing each other's thoughts and ideas on things in, in, in a very different way. So, so that tutor then went off and tried. To, the learners kept on saying, can we do this more? So from that, it spawned into a much wider project. But initially, it wasn't called Socratic. It was called Socratic Dialogues, but lots of tutors ran away thinking that this was far too clever a term. So in the end, that, that name, think it, that's where Thinking Folk comes from, because it's due to with thinking and inspired by the folk schools. And then before we know it, we knew it, we, we had more and more people wanting to try it, and literally hundreds of these conversations, dialogues, discourses happening um, for about a year. And I think that by the time it's, it's quoted in the paper, I can't remember how many, because th those discourses or dialogues are still continuing now. And a term that didn't exist at all, thinking folk, is now just an accepted name for um, a discourse that's not a debate. So um, the, the, the paper describes that process and... Yeah, it's been one of the best um, projects of my career. I don't know if that's five minutes or not. <laughs> no, 
That's great. Um, Gary, thank you very much. Um, no, I think it, it's um, certainly a very interesting process. I've read your article. <laughs> um, I would encourage the, um, any of our listeners here or whatever to, to participate or to actually go and read the article, but they'll get a little chance to hear more about that if you're um, joining Gary's workshop. So um, moving on then to our next author who is here to talk to us about um, her article is Lindsay Malone. Um, and her article was on engaging family carers across Ireland in higher education and it was a, a case study approach so um, go ahead Lindsay. Thanks Rosemary. Um, so my a paper was written, uh, co-written with uh, a colleague Catherine Cox who can't be here today from Family Carers Ireland so it's just me unfortunately. Um, so really our paper as you rightly say Rosemary was a case study um, and in 2018 when I previously worked in what was IT Carlo in the Faculty of Lifelong Learning uh, it came to our attention that carers as a cohort as a distinct group in society uh, had barriers and challenges in accessing higher education. So for those who are in receipt of a payment a family carers payment, they are precluded from entering higher education because there are restrictions around the, around the amount of hours that they can engage in education programs. So recognising that need, we made contact with Catherine, um, who is the head of communications with Family Carers Ireland, and asked us if there's something we can do from a part-time provision to address that need. Because I suppose myself and my head of faculty at the time felt that very much to Leo's point, learning is across the lifespan and it's a lifelong learning endeavour. And we were trying to find ways to open the doors to education through part-time provision. So a, a conversation over coffee um, finding out that Catherine was a graduate of the Institute certainly helped the project get off the ground um, and we managed to sit down and look at what carers needed and they were best placed to tell us that. So through Family Carers Ireland we met with a number of carers, heard what their needs were and the most important ethos of the programme from the very outset is that it, the intent was not to move the carers into anything else whether it was what, as Gary mentioned into employment or any other outcome other than recognising the position they already held as family carers in the lives of their their loved ones. So to, to create an accredited program that enabled them to get an accreditation for that valued work they already did. So um, we then drafted a level, uh, level six certificate, 10 credits and a certificate of family caring. And um, the carers uh, through Family Carers Ireland and their staff were on the writing team with us. They then were on the validation panel with us. So very much when we talk about co-creation, it wasn't that they told us the need and we then went off to our academic team and had it written and produced it back. It was that we did it together. So once it was validated, we then committed to delivering it in nine locations. That ranged from Donegal down as far as Cork. So we had big ambitions. What we didn't know is that COVID was around the corner. So we managed to deliver four in person and then had to pivot to online. At that point, we asked the question of Family Carers Ireland, should we stop? Like with COVID, is that enough that that's happening in the lives of carers at the moment? And is this becoming maybe an additional thing that they have to do in a very challenging time? The feedback was quite the opposite, that this became an outlet for the family carers to come together and to network with their colleagues and to find a source of support. So we continued on, deliver the remaining five uh, online and all through each group, each cohort gave feedback. So the program, the content of how it was delivered and the approach taken was tweaked to ensure that their voice was central to how this program actually continued over the nine iterations. Then at the end of what was a very successful um, project, we had an event in IT Carlo, our president was there to open it. And that was really important for us to demonstrate the importance of this program and this cohort of learners that we had worked with. Family Carers Ireland would estimate that there's 500,000 plus family carers across the country and usually if I'm if I'm honest, I'm not sure that a president would always be at an event where it's recognizing a 10th credit certificate, but we felt it was really important to put that um, importance on it. So then every year, um, higher education institutions can uh, apply under a case study to demonstrate an area of excellence that they have achieved in that year. So we felt that coming to the end of the project, that was a really successful one coming out of COVID and um, that it really had a, a special meaning in the lives of the learners that engaged with us, 94% of whom were first time um, learners in higher education. So we uh, made the proposal to the senior management team. They, they chose it as the case study and submitted it to the Higher Education Authority. And then Minister Harris announced that we were one of the successfully chosen projects that would now receive funding to roll the project out on a, a, a larger basis. So the Institute were awarded 1 million euro to the, expand that project over three years and expand the reach of it. So the paper really demonstrates the initial project, which was the, the creation of the initial certificate Certificate, how we worked with Family Carers Ireland and the importance of the learners' feedback throughout that process. And the outcome, which we couldn't have known at the beginning, 
was that that, that um, million euro funding allowed it now to be expanded on a much bigger scale and to really look at additional challenges such as um, young carers. They're a particularly different, difficult cohort to engage and to find that they're there. Some of them don't recognise themselves as young carers, even though they are in caring roles at home. So to try and create now a transitions programme to, to enable them to engage in either full time or part time programme is one of the um, areas that are being focused on through the new uh, expanded project. So that was it essentially. It was to um, create a meaningful co-creative process with Family Carers Ireland and indeed the carers to make a meaningful pro um, programme that enabled them to access higher education um, and to create a safe space um, and I suppose a bit of psychological safety in that classroom, whether it was in person or virtual, so that carers could engage in that process and it worked really well. So that's it. Thank you very much for that, Lindsay. Um, yes, very um, exciting project. And then moving on now to the, the last um, piece of work then that will be in this workshop is a book review on generative knowing. And um, this was carried out by George Kulauzid. I hope I pronounced that something <laughs> similar. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank you, Rosemary. Actually, you did a wonderful job with my last name. Uh, it's, it's very difficult even for the Greeks. So uh, really uh, do not have any, any you know, feeling, bad feelings about not, not saying something correct. So it's, it's OK. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I would like to congratulate, first of all, all of you for this wonderful um, publication. And it's it, for me, I think it's very important uh, to have open access uh, publications in the world of adult learning and education because uh, more and more it becomes more difficult really to find uh, good uh, and and uh, valid publications that are free to to read and you know um, and 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 work on them this so so that's, that's the work that you do in 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 Andes and it's it's brilliant and thank you very much now i i have um uh, I have. Uh, I was. I was. Uh, I actually. Uh, this is a, a very strange thing for me. Uh, first of all, I think uh, together with another guy, we are the only non-Irish or non-English, uh, you know, native English speakers in this group. So this is a little, um, you know, uh, let's say, uh, stressing for me. But any in any case, um, the book that I I I uh, this is a book. Here, this is the book that I actually um, reviewed for for the journal and for the readers of the journal, and I have I have uh, placed in the chat the uh, the the link where you can find uh, more information about it. This book <clears throat> is very much related to to, to what Professor Casey and uh, I really want also to thank him for his presentation uh, uh, talked about because it, it's something that builds on the theory of transformative learning. Uh, Aliki Nikolaidis, uh, the writer of the book, shares the same. Uh, uh, let's say she, she's for, she's of a Greek origin, but she's um, uh, she's an American actually, and um, she has studied a lot of transformative learning together with uh, Jack Mesro and his uh, uh, his group in uh, Teachers College. So. Uh, her work is building on on that. It's it's a book uh, about it's 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 where she in this book she tries to actually do something unique. She's trying to discuss um, the uh, the the experience of the experience. I don't know if I'm if I'm saying that correctly because I also had a lot of trouble, you know, when I was reading the book and trying to understand what she really means. She she really tries to. To make sure that uh, to 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 um, to promote the idea that uh, when we come to contact with things that put in question uh, the certainties that we usually employ to to live our life and to interpret our world, this is not something that we should be afraid of. But this is actually a point where real knowledge can emerge. So this is uh, and this is uh, she she calls her book generative knowing. Because I think she's trying to, uh, she's trying to, uh, to to promote a process uh, that is actually uh, inquiring beneath the experience itself, and and this is this is very interesting. And um, as she also says in in her book, to do that, uh, you need to 
publicly and ref reflectively expose uh, yourself and your ideas. And this is quite, uh, you know, threatening sometimes. And but she's she so the, in this book actually four four of the chapters of this book of this book are actually uh, a very reflective analysis of biographies, her own biography, her parents' biography, and the biography of one of her co uh, closest colleagues. Through this very reflective and in-depth analysis of these biographies, she's trying to promote the idea that confronting ambiguity and negotiating with the unknown is always an opportunity for the uh, development of, of, of knowledge. Um, in this, in that sense, she's not trying to, um, and this was very interesting because usually, you know, in the adult learning theory, let's say, realm, um, uh, uh, okay, okay, I have one more minute, okay. Uh, in the, in this realm, usually, usually theorists, you know, try to confront each other, you know, say, oh, he, this is not right, this is wrong, and you forgot this, this is, should be mentioned, and so forth. But uh, Aliki doesn't try to do that. She's actually using all of transformative theories available she uses uh, the work of Dewey of Peter Jarvis and, and Jack Mesereau and uh, the philosoph philosophers like Deleuze in order to develop something very new uh, something that I believe it's a starting a, 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 an emerging theory it's, it's not so the reader will not find you know fixed answers or something very concrete there but definitely an exciting idea, an exciting view of how uh, learning uh, occurs and how knowing actually becomes a reality through um, uh, through the analysis and through confronting this kind of of experiences that sometimes we avoid too. So the whole book, and I'm I'm, I'm finishing with this. The whole book is actually, uh, you know, if you know transformative learning theory or the the uh, the learning theory of Peter Jarvis, they both say that everything starts with a disjuncture. Everything starts with a dilemma. Something that makes us understand where are we going? What's going on? Like like Leo said very well. Well, the whole book is about what's going on. It's a question. It's it's not an answer. And this is the value of it. It gives you more questions to, to, to work on rather than giving you answers uh, predefined and fixed that you can actually rely on them. So I hope uh, you will find it and the readers of the, of the, of the journal will find the book uh, joyful and they will like the idea of reading it. Um, it's nice. Of course, it has some flaws like all books, but uh, it's a new idea. So let's uh, let's see how it goes. OK, thank you very much again for 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 hosting me in your journal and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to present it to your uh this interesting group of friends and colleagues that was more than a minute right yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that george yes and indeed um you know the book sounds so exciting um we always like to have more questions than answers so we move on then to um our next um section then is on equal access and we have Dan O'Sullivan to talk about his article on youth reach learners all growing up. Thank you, Dan. Um, Rosemary, please tell me you can hear me. I can, yes. Not a Thank problem. Thank God. I've had a, a nightmare with technical issues this morning. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I suppose um, the, the youth reach is very much a, a story of narrative um, and um you know the the perceptions of it um and when i first began researching in youth reach um what i was very struck by was the negative perception that the learners had of themselves and of their life chances and uh where they were going in life they tend to have kind of written themselves off um which i found um very disturbing and unfortunate and um I suppose there, uh, it, it, when, when you're teaching in that setting, there is a certain uh, cohort who are very much a minority who tend to uh, draw a lot of your attention. And um, they, 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 they might not necessarily be representative of uh, the student body, but um, they certainly uh, attract a lot of attention. And uh, just drawing on, uh, on what Gary was saying this morning, uh, you know, the, the lie becomes the truth and the, the sensationalization gives truth to the lie. And um, 
you know, and the, the hard cases, because uh, you do get very extreme cases of very extreme poverty and, and deprivation in youth reach. And uh, there are a, a small minority of, of, of people who'd be, you know, they'd be in the paper for very serious crime. And um, all the success stories are kind of overshadowed then by, um, you know, um, you know, a particularly kind of sensational thing that might happen in the community with a former student. And that becomes kind of the label on all the, the centres then that the, the students, uh, all the students would be associated with this type of activity. Um, so I, I kind of set out to interview um, some of uh, former students of youth reach um, uh, in from five different youth reach centres. And um, because I wanted to kind of, um, you know, give you know attack that kind of sensationalist lie uh, and uh, there's very little we hear from from students after they leave and uh so i wanted to kind of get in touch and see how they're getting on and uh it, it was great um because uh they were all actually doing very very well um and uh you know there's the stereotypes associated with the working class you know the working class loser alienation from kind of the labor market and all these things and uh some of what leo was saying there this morning is very interesting as well you know there's kind of further uh alienation in the digital world uh particularly post covid uh people more and more going down rabbit holes and echo chambers uh and there's a lot of toxic debate and false narratives so i suppose uh the purpose of this research was to kind of challenge some of those uh false narratives and um what what we did what, what we actually discovered was um a lot uh a lot of the state the, the, the former students they were um so they, they were still doing the same job that they they did actually um, done during their work experience as part of youth reach. Now uh, they might have still been in the same position, but they were in the same employment, so they might have been promoted, um, but they were uh, they, they they were still in the same job. And a lot of them spoke about um, being kind of alienated in the in in this in this post primary schools they had been in, because there was such a focus on going to college. And they said, uh, you know, if if you didn't want to go to college or, you, you you know, you weren't that way inclined, that the teachers just didn't want to know, you were dismissed um, and really didn't, the, the teachers didn't take much interest in you. Um, so that was, that was one of the things uh, the, the students focused on as well, the former students rather, I should say, was the culture of high support uh, that they, uh, and the, the, the support they received from their teachers in youth reach because, um, they, they were much more interested in them. They took uh, an active interest in their lives, their hobbies, and they weren't just focusing on, um, you know, uh, you know how many points you get. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm here in UL now, and we have a saying in UL, they don't ask you your name, they ask you your QCA. Um, so the, 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 the academic focus and the academic pressure was certainly, uh, the, the foot was taken off the gas in that regard in youth reach. Um, and uh, life skills as well were very important. Uh, one of the students said in, in, in youth reach, uh, they don't just teach you a particular subject, they teach you how to be a person, um, which I found uh, uh, very interesting. Um, and, and, you know, just in terms of practical things like feeding yourself um, uh, as well as getting a job. So career planning was also something that they found very, very useful. Um, almost, uh, in my experience from talking to, to, to teachers in youth reach, uh, the career planning was nearly uh, a boon. Uh, they, 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 they felt they were doing too much of it. But uh, the, the, the students, uh, the former students that I interviewed certainly seemed uh, to be very appreciated of it. And also um, the, the diversity in it. Um, it wasn't completely focused on going to college. Um, there were, uh, you know, kind of strange ones like, how do you become a farrier? Now, most teachers in a post-primary setting wouldn't have any uh, knowledge or information about uh, how to go about pursuing a career as a farrier, uh, but in youth reach, they would. So uh, those, those, those were uh, kind of the key issues that, um, uh, that were identified as part of the study. Um, and um, yeah, the culture of high support, life skills, work experience, and career planning, um, they, they were all certainly... <clears throat> 
the, the, the key teams that were identified from the interviews. Um, the students themselves, uh, so, so there was there was some, um, there, there is a bit of uh, um, debate, I, I suppose, around um, the, the, the qualifications of teachers in youth reach. Um, and there is um, certainly a lack of qualified uh, guidance counsellors in youth reach. But I suppose it's 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 almost spread across all the teachers, and uh, they have a a, a mentoring um, uh, system that was kind of introduced uh, because of the lack of qualified guidance uh, counselors, and also the, the other side of counsel guidance counseling, which would be the um, the almost the psychological element of it because a lot of the the the, the students would be um would, would be seeking psychological uh, support services um so mary gordon uh, would have championed the, the the mentoring system and uh the mentoring system um i suppose it's not designed to to, to replace uh any of the uh the you know the psychological support services that that that, that might have been put in place by um, a, a, a psychotherapist, uh, and some centres had access to to psychotherapists, um, whereas uh, other ones uh, they, they, they didn't. So there was a trade off there between uh, and kind of a, a dichotomy between um, psychological support services and um, sign of mentoring. Um, and, and key working, and I suppose very much the the uh, the key working uh, element in youth reach has kind of been put uh, on the back burner since the retirement of Mary Gordon, and I suppose it's up to someone uh, a, a bit younger now that Mary has retired to kind of uh, uh, to 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 take on that baton, and uh, I'm certainly considering uh, uh, moving in that direction myself. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, okay, so moving swiftly on, then we're going to move on to Aidan Mahan, who is going to talk about um, his article on work-based adult learning um, online. Can you hear me, Rosemary? Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Rosemary. Thanks very much for, for having us here this morning. Delighted to be here with my co-author on, on this paper and driving force behind uh, Sardas, Lindsay Malone. Uh, the genesis for CERDAS, or the Centre for Insurance Risk and Data Analytics Studies, quite a mouthful, uh, was a cup of coffee again with Lindsay, which seems to be common with, with a lot of big projects that happened in SETU and, and now the ETB, I think. But um, really, in December 2019, the, the HEA announced uh, the HDI Pillar 3 call. Um, again, over a cup of coffee, Lindsay and I thought we have something to add here, so we put together the outline for what we at the time that was CERDAS, combining, I suppose, the unique skills and outlook of the lifelong learning department in SETU and the InsureTech, which, which I worked in, the InsureTech unit that we had then at SETU at the time, or IT Carlo at the time. Um, in March, then, we were successful in being awarded 1.725 million for the project, for a five-year project in partnership then with ATU Letterkenny. Um, really, the, the, the gist of it really was centered around an agile approach to program development in consultation with the needs of both work-based learners and employers and really around their unique needs, uh, you know, flexible, granular approach. So we, uh, with that in mind, we set out to co-create programs with industry rather than develop a program, then try to sell that or, or fill that from industry. We really set out to the, with the linkings that we had with the industry, we, we set out to co-develop the programs. We actually had them on board in the application process and we had the, an outline of some programs really early in play about wh where the needs were um, and, and those specific needs of the employees in the, in the insured sector. Um, our programs, which are available in a very granular fashion uh, on a module by module basis, range from everything from masterclass to a level uh, eight or nine cert to a HTIP to a master's program. And they're delivered in an online, sort of flexible manner, again, around the need of the work based learner. Um, they're they're in, highlighted on page 100 there, but you can see that there's quite a broad, broad range of them. And they're centered around four pillars four delivery pillars, the, the ideas of business thinking, design thinking, data analytics, and equality, diversity, and inclusion was a, a fourth pillar we added uh, based on significant industry demand, some masterclasses we ran, and a huge uh, need for it, uh, I suppose, from regulatory and uh, you know, employee-led demand. There was, there was a huge interest in EDI. Um, so we, 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 it's, it's, it's informed and 
developed around well best international practice, I suppose, in lifelong learning. And Lindsay would have been led out on that end of it, but it was all about the needs of the learner delivered at times, sometimes out of hours, sometimes in work, in, in an online sort of hour and a half a session a week, sort of flexible fashion. Um, and again, that's demonstrated, in, the flexibility is demonstrated by some of the masterclass we delivered, uh, which is highlighted on page 101 of the article, but it's just shown that those masterclasses and everything from data analytics, unconscious bias, Okay, I think we've um, uh, lost the other. <laughs> so, can you hear me, Lindsay? Yeah. Mike, for join in. Yeah, sorry, it's dropping a bit here with the Wi-Fi, but no, it, it it the uptake has been very positive. We've had huge numbers through master classes and a range of different programs. Again, the, the interest in EDI has been a surprise, and I suppose a nice win for for Lindsay and myself in terms of seeing that and, and delivering something of impact to industry but uh, no I, I, we think it's a great demonstration of industry and academia collab collaboration again and, and Lindsay and the, the LLL approach that we had at the time was a huge win for what we could what we could deliver there Lindsay might add anything she needs to there on, on that I think you covered it Aidan I don't think anyone's ever going to go for a cup of coffee with me after your intro um, <laughs> but other than that <laughs> um, look I suppose what you didn't say is I was brought the lifelong learning side of the house but what Aidan brought was the industry focus so in his previous role he was very connected with all the small medium and the large um, enterprise companies in the space of insurance and financial services so we could leverage his expertise and also your contacts Aidan to be able to meet with them have them as part of the program writing teams again and the um, validation teams and then bring um, the programs to them and validate them with them. So I think the, the uniqueness and the success of the project of, that was CERDAS is the fact that we had very different skill sets and very different approaches that we could mm. blend together very well to ultimately make sure we, we had the maximum amount of flexibility and agile provision for learners who were in a workplace environment. And I think we really managed to achieve that over a five year project period. So, yeah. Yep. OK, thank you very much. Um, and then the final um, contribution that we have for this section then is um, a book review by Jane Kelly, who unfortunately can't be here. Um, and basically, um, Jane was um, reviewing the book called Poor, written by Katrina O'Sullivan. And this book contains a very personal narrative um, of the author's own experience um, of growing up in poverty. Um, and what Jane thought was very important in this um, book was not just the experiences was of material poverty, but what the author also called a poverty of worth. Um, and in the book, or in her review, sorry, Jane argues, you know, that this book is very important, you know, today because it, you know, it indicts really the continuing system of inequality and inequity that still exists within the UK education system. And I think that that's something that will resonate with all of our listeners and participators today, um, not just across Ireland, but also across the globe. Um, so if we move on then to our next section, which is on policy and practice. And again, um, the authors, Ashley Brennan and, and Maven O'Grady, unfortunately, can't be with us today. Um, their article, which was uh, reading between the lines, exploring the implementation of Irish further education and training policy at practice level. And um, this paper um, is really, um, you know, raising a number of concerns regarding uh, not just this policy, sorry, this policy, not just on educators, but actually ultimately on the adult learners who, you know, as we know, often really bear the brunt then of those wider policy decisions and particularly the negative impacts that um, you know then they are really faced to carry the burden with so that's probably the key um, elements really of Jane Kelly's um, sorry uh, Ashley Brennan and Maeve O'Grady's um, article and I'm going to then move on to um, Gavin Sheridan who um, is going to talk to us about his article thank you Gavin. Hi yeah can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. great, great, great. Um, so, yeah, my article is quite brief. I uh, came here as a teacher of uh, further education and um, my experiences initially with the whole period of lockdown and being thrown online and um, just the emergency remote teaching. Then afterwards, if it doesn't sound too glib, you know, I didn't want to waste the learning from the online experience. And so I started looking into 
blended learning, looked at the guidelines of my ETB and found the working definition was from Garrison and Canu Canuka, that, or Canuka, sorry, that it was um, blended learning is the integration of um, classroom, face-to-face -face teaching and online um, learning as well. But fine, I went back a little further then to the awarding body in QQI and they're using the same um, definition and then I went to the original source just to see if I could broaden things out for myself so I could see things a little clearer. And I discovered that, in fact, Garrison and Kanuka and their definition includes the word thoughtful. So it's the thoughtful uh, integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences and online learning experiences. And that word thoughtful being removed um, for me changed the definition significantly that the, um, the qualitative element of um, the original writer's thoughts was removed uh, kind of um, made me look a little closer then at the wording wording in general in the guidelines that I was supposed to be following and though uh, QQI say that the guidelines are not intended to prescribe how blended learning is delivered it reminded me of the choice that um, the early motor manufacturer Henry Ford gave his um, customers in terms of car color, that they could have any color as long as it was black, that um, these guidelines were moving in just one direction and it was quite quantitative. And the language, in fact, is the language of the marketplace. Um, there are a couple of mentions in these very short guidelines, uh, 18 or 20 pages long, mention twice of um, the risk of reputational damage for providers if, if they don't follow closely the um, the guidelines. There's ten. There are ten mentions of um, terms and or of um, the terms and conditions. That, well, anyway, the neoliberal language is um, quite alarming uh, throughout the uh, fit for purpose. Ten times over, uh, terms and conditions for learners to be aware of, and so on. So um, I felt that, yeah, I should, as a what's termed a, a taker of policy, that I should actually look at uh, language rather than simply accepting it um, that uh, things could be contested and that really I might have a professional duty as um, a teacher, as an educator to um, look more closely at what I was receiving as um, true or self-evident um, as a practitioner. If as I went through the guidelines then I saw as well with all this counting that and efficiency that maybe you have to question, well, you know, what is the purpose of the efficiency um, if it's just becomes a, an end in itself rather than a, a means of achieving greater learning um, that could be disappointing. And as a practitioner talking with colleagues and working as an external authenticator in the further education sector, I sometimes do wonder if, um, efficiency is um, driving things a little more than it should and that innovation and um, independence and uh, professional judgment is uh, slipping from the uh, the area of the, um, the teacher and their interaction with their students. At the end of these guidelines, uh, I mentioned Minister Harris pointing out that uh, there's potential for uh, blended learning um, to enhance the uh, position of people who are disadvantaged, people with disabilities and so on in education. But the final piece in the guidelines is very, very short, mentions that um, blended learning may be of use when working with students with um, additional needs, but that is it. And the, um, the tiny add-on that that is, is seems emblematic of the, um, the kind of the emphasis, the neoliberal emphasis in these guidelines that um, people with additional challenges are simply small in the shortest section at the end of the guidelines. So my recommendations for <clears throat> myself or anybody else reading official guidelines would be, um, well, the umbrella recommendation is in my um, title, caveat, lector, uh, reader beware, but um, also maybe to consider um, pushing back a little against um, official policy and guidelines if they uh, need to be uh, resisted a little. So um, in that sense, my short article is my um, pushback in this area. Not five minutes, but thank you. 
Thank you very much for that, Gavin. That's um, excellent. Thank you. And we're moving on then to our last contribution, um, which is a policy review by Nula Blanton um, on the Further Education and Training Funding Model Review Final Report. Thank you, Nula. Hi, Rosemary. Merry Thank Christmas you. There. <laughs> I, I, I'm at Hi. another event. Apologies. Gorgeous. I just popped out for a minute. <laughs> it's not my home. <laughs> It's not my home. Um, Rosemary, thank you. There's a lot of overlap actually between um, my, my review and Ashling Brennan, Maeve O'Grady's article and Gavin Sher Sheridan's article. So the discussion should be very interesting. Um, uh, Gavin talked about the neoliberal language and the creep of conformativity. Um, and the, um, he made a very good point actually that accountability is welcomed, but it's when it's as a tool to support professional work. So um, a lot of overlap there. So the the um, outcomes-based model of funding that's been introduced by SOLAS um, was a, a commitment made in the in the first further education and training strategy, and, and it promises to be a robust, efficient, and data-driven funding model. So there are lots of advantages to it in terms of uh, previously there were 34 sep separate programs, which was difficult to manage. That's been reduced now to five different pots of funding, and the aim is to incentivize ETBs to increase efficiency. Um, they also identified a disproportionate level of funding um, across ETBs for this work, um, and they, they aim to have a simpler, fairer, more transparent model. Um, and it's in line with the strategic performance. Sorry, I think we've lost you there. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes, got you now. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so in the guidelines, they said that funding for um, adult literacy, ESOL, youth reach um, and community education would be would be ring fenced. Um, but it, it, I suppose it remains to be seen whether that will happen in practice. Um, so just the policy is short on some detail. Um, it says it aims to ease the administrative burden for ETBs while enhancing tracking and reporting at the same time. So I know the, the, the details form has significantly increased the administrative burden in ETBs. So it'll be interesting to see how the administration can be reduced. Um, the, the report also doesn't look at the appropriateness of the outcomes that they're measuring. So for example, even the lifelong learning measurements doesn't count learners under 25 or over 64 and the widening participation measure um, only looks at a couple of categories for widening participation and it involves completing section five of the learner details form so any adults that are disadvantaged it, it's very challenging for them to complete all that information on the learner details form um, the, the focus seems to be very much on the economic objectives of FET rather than the social objectives of FET that, that aren't being measured um, and I suppose it's creating a new culture of data collection and ranking and competition between the ETBs, which isn't necessarily in the best interests of adult education. Um, so Simon Harris made a good quote that the new funding model um, would harness what's so special and valuable about FET. But I suppose we need to be careful um, and reflect on what is special and valuable about FET before we start counting it and introducing an outcomes-based model of funding. Thanks, Rosemary. Okay, thank you very much, Nilla. And um, thanks to everyone, all of our um, contributors this morning, and obviously also to the authors who weren't able to make it today. But I think what's really important is we can really see that um, crossover, you know, between that, you know, some of the ideas expressed today around that sort of general knowing and Socratic dialogue and the discourse, you know, and then we, you know, hear people looking at reviews and practice and, and having that kind of critical questioning going on. So I hope that that has really um, warmed us up, I suppose, for the, the breakout discussions where we'll be really um, ready to engage in that critical discourse. So I'll hand over to Dervil and I. Thank you. Um, so we're going to jump into our feedback from the rooms. We're going to keep the uh, feedback short just to make sure we can finish on time. And I'm going to hand over to Karen first. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm still scribbling down my feedback notes. Um, the 30 minutes passed very quickly. So um, we had lots to discuss. So we've just come up with a couple of key points. Um, one of the things that came out of our group is that people who learn in a traditional way seem to be the people who end up becoming the educators in the end. So we're missing a step here. 
so it, it's kind of um it continues through the years and through the generations that the people who learn in this way are becoming educators and then are possibly teaching in this way and students are then learning in this way so it's kind of a self-perpetuating myth and it's very hard to break that cycle so that's something that came out as a point um our second feedback point sorry, just one second um we're very much in agreement that the system is truly not focused on the learner so i think somebody made a point that we need to unlearn what the education system has taught us you know um it's very much you you are the teacher you are the expert the learner feels that and much as we try to change it there is still that sort of power dynamic so it's very much about you know empowering learners to realize you have expertise in your own learning and we were talking about the importance of leadership training because students are still suffering the most. Um, and then also we were talking about the kind of pressurized working environment for educators, which kind of takes away from class preparation. So they're very much focused on curriculum. And, you know, as people said earlier in their in their presentations, they're so focused on curriculum and it kind of takes away from class preparation or also to allow kind of more exploration of more learner centered teaching. Um, so kind of students are disempowered from the get go. So they're kind of the main points from our group in a in a very short nutshell. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Loads in there. I'm going to jump now to Katie or to Kate. Sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, my group was um, learning, development and holistic thinking, and I took loads of notes, but I'm just going to share two very brief points in the interest of time. So um, we had uh, Gary and George uh, as, from the contributors as part of our group, and we discussed um, how can we support more inclusive measures of success. So I suppose um, the two main things that I that stuck in my head anyway were that we need to um, move away from measuring things in terms of outputs and moving more into uh, stories, which as uh, many of the Aintus team will know, is, was music to my ears as a communications <laughs> person. Um, so stories and um, the idea of understanding better rather than measuring better. Um, and also the idea of, uh, we spoke a lot about um, the importance of community um, and Jackie, who was part of our group, talked about community education and the experience of that. The idea of reclaiming the idea of community in adult learning. And I suppose the main thing that we kept coming back to was the importance of humanity and dignity as the essence of adult learning. So it was a really great group. Thanks, everybody. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Kate. And I'll pass over now to Lorraine. Yeah, hi. Some of ours were very similar, but I think we were quite solution focused, really, I suppose, in terms of and what we spoke about. So we talked about, um, you know, that focus on spending that 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 so much time on those negative students. So and ways to overcome that is like you know bringing local communities in, seeing what's being done in there, and bringing the local press in, it, 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 emphasizing positive stories as opposed to negative stories. And um, again, the soft skills approach came in us as well, and the how performance matrix are how can we measure that, and um. Fran had mentioned that there was a, a pilot done last year on that, but no one seems to really know anything about it. And uh, that would be interesting to see. So how we could do that and where, where could that go in the future? Because I do think we really do, we, we all agree that we do really need to measure soft skills as opposed to those really just um, academic skills. And we had a beautiful uh, quote, I think, from Leo Casey that called uh, Community Ed the Premier Division of Education, which I loved. And it needs to, and I, I loved um, the philosophy behind it as well. You know, those better affirmations on of the quality of um, youth reach and the teachers and the need to celebrate and have public um, acclamation um, for uh, youth reach success. As we see, leaving search, junior search every year, you know, um, up there, oh, these are the results. The students are doing wonderfully, but we don't see this from these type of programs, which would really give that really positive um, I suppose, um, PR. Again, social media, got to find these toxic identities. Um, I know we're all a bit tired of it now, but the far right having these influences on all youth reach students are out there running a muck in town and stuff like that. So uh, again, looking at things like that. And um, and, and lastly, and not least, um, I do think it's worth saying, uh, mentoring of, um, Dan had mentioned earlier on about youth reach teachers and all of us that worked in community ed were kind of having an awful lot of hats on. And uh, being a mentor in youth reach, it's a it's a really core and very it's a very important 
job, yet there's no specific training. So maybe looking at training around mentoring training in youth reach and community ed. So Fantastic. that was um, thank you so much. much, Shireen. Brilliant. And now I'll pass over to Ashling. Uh, thank you. I will try to keep this very brief. Um, really interesting discussion from our group, which was on policy and practice. So um, we're kind of looking at how uh, policy frameworks kind of could encourage uh, alt educators to demonstrate the impact of their work, especially impact that is not easily quantified numerically. So, um, yeah, kind of reflecting what other people, what the feedback of other groups are kind of saying, just an overemphasis on in in some of the policies, uh, FED strategy and that on, um, yeah, kind of things that can be quantified uh, rather than, yeah, looking at maybe uh, learner stories or quality qualitative kind of impact uh, of FET um, that, yeah, the, the you know, there there's obviously a lot of merit to uh, quantifiable uh, data. It gives the breadth of provision, uh, whereas uh, qualitative um, uh, data can give the breadth of the provision. Um, there was a lot of kind of talk on how uh, tutor kind or practitioner voices aren't really listened to um, and how important these are. Um, and should be kind of considered in policy uh, writing. Um, and yeah, there's just a there's just a good bit of kind of concern that there's the creep of performativity um, with outcomes based models um, in a lot of the, the policies um, and that adult education philosophies are really threatened by the, this kind of shift. Um, but yeah. Uh, emphasis on on kind of positive stories from from learners. Um, it could really kind of change the landscape of um, uh, policy in adult education in the country. Brilliant. Well done. <laughs> We've managed to get loads in there. It's like a big squish sandwich. Um, I'm gonna now quickly pass to Rosemary. Rosemary, we're already at twelve thirty one, so you and I have a a tough job to get through this now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely we don't want to keep people back from their lunch or whatever else they have to go on to do but just want to thank everyone for um participating um in today's event i hope you have found it really beneficial i know i certainly have and i mean even just listening to the feedback from all of the workshops and going i wish it wasn't that one i wish it wasn't that one but we can't be everywhere at once but um uh, hopefully we will get the um feedback from the uh, on that will be passed on i think um to the people who have participated so we, and again i just urge people to go into the journal and explore some of those articles in more depth if you haven't already had a chance to do so um but thank you all for your contribution today i think we've had some excellent discussion and food for for thought and food for our soul <laughs> thank you brilliant thanks so much rosemary yeah and just to echo what rosemary said Please do enjoy reading the journal, share it with your colleagues, friends and your students. It is the only journal out there for adult learning. So it's important that people studying education get access to it. And uh, we'd be delighted if you would also like to uh, send in a contribution for next year. The deadline is February uh, 16th, 2024. We're already talking about the new year, but here we are. And um, thank you again for joining us. Well done to everybody involved and have a lovely break. Thanks again. See you soon. Bye.